Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we study and research Bible prophecy. Our topic tonight is exposing the Illuminati from within. You see, my Bible tells me that we are supposed to expose the, the devices of the devil. We're supposed to fight evil at every corner. Well, how can we fight it when we don't understand it, we do, when we don't know about it? Because many times it is hidden. Uh, after all, the Satan, the, the devil, is the most subtle beast of the field. And our speaker tonight is uniquely qualified to speak on it because he was uh, spent many years in it. As a matter of fact, he was author of seven books. He was a satanic and voodoo high priest, ninth degree oriento templi orientis, ordo templi orientis, second degree church of Satan, new age guru, occultist, chandler. He taught astrology, tarot cards, Astro projection, and he's a ninth degree Rosicrucian and a 90th degree Mason and a member of the Illuminati. Will you help me welcome Bill Schneblin? Well, I'd like to correct one thing I'm a former member of the Illuminati. Amen? Because I received the light of Jesus Christ, and I'm excited about that. Um, folks, I am here tonight because I am a great believer in the fact that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And that's why I want to begin by sharing with you very briefly my testimony of how I came through a great deal of darkness into the light of Jesus Christ. Then we're going to try and get into our material. We have... We have a tremendous amount to talk about here tonight and to cover, and uh, I, just, I just ask for your patience and your prayers as we, we try to steam through this. Um, I started out wanting to serve God in the worst possible way, and for the first 30 years of my life, that's exactly what I did. I was raised in a very religious home, uh, but I didn't know Jesus Christ from a doorknob. I, I didn't know much about the Bible. I wanted to get into the ministry, which in my case was through the uh, Roman Catholic Church. That's what I was raised in. And I knew very little about the Bible, and I wanted to be a priest. When I got to college, however, I had my plan somewhat derailed by two forces that were very strong at that time. This was the time of the Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council, when a lot of ferment was taking place in the Catholic Church. A lot of my professors were telling me that the Bible wasn't really true, what little I knew about the Bible was false, that Moses didn't really part the Red Sea, that uh, Adam and Eve never really existed, that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. What did that leave me? You know, here I was going to be a priest, and I didn't know what to believe in. The other thing that happened, two convergent forces, is I had some professors that today would have been called New Agers. Back then, the word wasn't even heard of. And they played on a doctrine that's part of Catholic theology. And this doctrine is the idea that the priest is another Christ. And when you go up on the altar and you confect the sacrament of the Eucharist, as it's called, which means you turn the bread and wine literally into the body and blood of Jesus, you are acting literally as another Christ. And they told me, these, these particular professors, if I wanted to do that, if I wanted to be another Christ... I had to do the same things that Jesus did to attain that exalted state. See, they did not believe that Jesus was God Almighty. They believed he was a kind of ascended master and that he had learned how to do all of these things by going and studying under gurus in the Far East and studying under the Magi of Egypt. And some of you may have heard about this, either from bookstores or TV shows, the lost years of Jesus. Now, here I was. I was 18, 19 years old. I was being told this stuff by people who had PhDs, THDs, DDs, you know, all that stuff behind their name, you know, Roman collars on. What was I supposed to think? So I believed them. I began studying the occult because I thought this was a way that I would become more Christ-like. See the sinister logic behind this? Amen? And, and when you don't have, see, that's the problem. When you don't have an objective standard of truth to measure anything with, you can, it's like having a rubber ruler, Amen? You can take a ruler, and if it stretches, you can make an inch this long, you know? And that's what these people were doing. That's why this is called the canon of Scripture. Canon in Greek means ruler or measuring stick. This is our measuring stick for truth. But I didn't understand that at that time. So what happened was 
I fell into this. And by the time I got through most of my college years, I had realized that the most efficient way, the most powerful way to acquire occult knowledge was, in fact, to become a witch. Now, that might seem a pretty broad jump from being a candidate for the ministry to becoming a witch, but that's what I did. And, and so by the time I got out of high school, uh, college, I had written the King of the Witches, Alex Sanders, over in London, and he had directed me to a, a coven that was in Plymouth, Massachusetts. All this was taking place, I should explain, in Iowa, of all places. I mean, what a place to find witches, you know, right in the, the heartland. But let me tell you, you can find witches anywhere nowadays. And so by the time I got out of college, some of you already um, saw this, but this is what I ended up looking like. I was quite a freak. In fact, somebody on the tour this time said I looked like Jerry Garcia, which I don't know if that was a compliment or not. But as you can see, I had a lot more hair in those days. Um, anyway, I went out and I took a leave of absence from my seminary duties. And I, I went and taught high school for a couple of years and met my wife. Uh, she also had a profound interest in witchcraft and the occult, had been studying it for some time. And so we ended up getting together. And um, we found that there was a fellow who was the Grand Master Druid of all North America down in Arkansas. Uh, and he lived out in the country. Uh, you find that amusing, don't you? <laughs> We're going to be talking more about Arkansas before the evening is over, believe me. Anyway, he, um, he lived in a little tiny, well, actually he lived out in the country near a little tiny town called Hattieville, Arkansas. And from there he ran a huge network of druids all over the United States. And he saw some promise, quote unquote, in my wife and I, and offered us to come down and study directly under him to become high priest and high priestess of the Druids. So that's what we did. We went down and um, spent three months in the summertime studying under this man and learning all the mysteries of the five points of the pentagram, all the mysteries of hermetics and mental magic and natural medicine and all sorts of stuff. Um, while we're down there, one thing that bears reporting, because it bears directly on some things we're going to speak about later on this evening, is uh, that we'd sit on a, par on a park bench, or a picnic table, rather, under the stars every night, and we would learn about these occult mysteries. And almost every night, over the, over the mountain that we were, we were living on, we'd see a UFO hovering that was quite plain, plain as day and uh, looked like a, like a long cigar-shaped thing with lights around it and was, was as clear to me. It looked about the size of a baseball held at arm's length. And we'd always ask him, what is that? And he would never tell us, because I already had had an abiding interest in UFOs, which had started when I was uh, even a teenager. I was involved with NICAP, which is the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, and it's now, I don't think it's functioning anymore, but at that time it was one of the two more reputable flying saucer groups in the country. So anyway, we got ordained as high priest and high priestess, and we were married for time and all eternity by a witch hand fasting in Zion State Park over in Zion, Illinois, which is just north of Chicago, uh, in a magic circle with 200 witches standing around us, a huge circle with all of them dressed in black and a big bonfire in the center. And uh, after that, we went out on our way to spread the gospel of witchcraft. However, a funny thing began to happen. We went from city to city. We, we finally found that the best place to be was in Milwaukee because there we had 90 students in advance lined up who wanted to learn witchcraft. This was in the mid-70s. And so what happened was we settled there and we began to set up regular classes and covens. Before we knew it, though, new things began to come on the horizon. Um, both some of my friends who were witches, in fact, the guy who owned the occult bookstore in town, and also some of my spirit guides, because I was also a trans medium, or what today you would call a channeler. I'd been ordained as a spiritualist minister and trained in that, um, began to tell us that if we really wanted to understand the deep parts of witchcraft, we need to get involved in Satanism. We need to read the Satanic Bible. And so I bought a copy and looked that over, and it was very, very interesting. I found, I agreed with much of it, which would have astonished me just a few years earlier when I'd begun my occult studies. And see, this is how Satan does things. He gradually introduces you to ever more and more bizarre doctrines until all of a sudden you're overwhelmed. Well, I joined the Church of Satan, and soon after that, 
I, uh, I ended up getting the second degree in the Church of Satan, which is called Warlock. This is the certificate, <coughs> excuse me, that you will see. This is also in a couple of my books. It's reproduced. You'll notice down at the bottom here, I even got Anton LaVey's autograph. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, anyway, I want to just point out a couple of things here. Notice that it says, the Church of Satan having, you know, passed before the Council of Nine, order the trapezoid. Now, remember that. That's going to be significant later. Uh, also, I should explain that I had legally changed my name because Christopher Pendragon's sin was much more numerologically powerful than William Sneblin. Plus, it sounded a lot more dramatic, don't you think? I was, I was a Reverend Dr. Sin. Doesn't that, that sound like a character on a TV show or a soap opera or something? Anyway, um, so that was what was happening. Uh, so we began to work in, in Satanism, and I learned that, that, that Anton LaVey, and this may astonish some of you, but Anton LaVey's brand of Satanism is like kid stuff. It's entry-level Satanism, so to speak, because it's used primarily to draw people into the darker stuff. And it's very evil, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's not like it's a Sunday school picnic or anything, but compared to the real serious Satanism, it's, it's totally, totally harmless, relatively speaking. In order to get into that, though, there was something very important I had to do. I had to become a Freemason because you can't get involved in Satanism on the hardcore level without first being a Freemason. And so I found someone, I was sponsored into the Masons, and I became a first, second, third degree Mason. Uh, I went through the York Rite. I went through the shrine. In fact, this is my, uh, my little shrine portrait here. As you can see, by this time, I'd kind of shed some of my hippie appearance. Uh, <laughs> I just shudder every time I see that thing. Um, but this is just kind of by way of documentation that I, I really was involved in these things. That was my official shrine portrait, which they took as part of my initiation. Uh, then soon after that, I, I went through the Scottish Rite as well. So I basically covered all the branches of masonry that there are to do. Uh, and then I went even beyond that. But uh, this is my certificate as a, as a uh, sublime prince of the royal secret. That's the title, 32nd degree Mason. See, Masons love big sounding titles. I mean, they just think that's the greatest thing. You know, you, they have titles like perfect master, most perfect master, perfect excellent master. You know, I mean, you know, like these people have a self-esteem problem, right? <laughs> anyway, there's a couple things I just want you to notice about this, and I'll come back to it later. You'll notice the all-seeing eye up there, and you'll notice the motto, Ordo Ab Cow. And we'll talk more about those later. Uh, so once I went through all of that, I was worthy I was ready to become involved in hardcore Satanism. What did that mean? Well, that meant I had to sell my soul to the devil. I didn't know that the devil already had it. Amen. This is a little ceremony that the devil likes to do, and I had to sign my name on the contract in blood. I had to sign my name in the black book. The deal was that I got seven years in which the devil would give me anything I wanted. He'd given me wine, women, song, dope, power, you name it, I'd have it. Then at the end of those seven years, he got to kill me and take me to hell. What a deal. Anybody want to sign up? Yeah, you see, you got to understand something. The satanic doctrine here is that hell is not what we believe it is or what the Bible teaches it is. The satanic doctrine is that hell is this incredible party. It's like a nonstop, all-eternity orgy. So you're, you're smoking dope, you're fornicating your brains out, you're listening to rock and roll through all eternity. And it's party-hardy time, whereas we were told that he heaven was a place where losers, that it couldn't stand the dark, violent ecstasies of hell, would just sit up there and strum on a dang harp for all eternity and just be bored, silly. So, bad scene. We thought hell was better. So this was how deceived I became. I went out and I got more and more involved in these various things. Uh, I signed up more people to get to sell their souls to the devil. I'm ashamed to say that now. But uh, continually this was happening. And um, essentially, the next thing that happened, before I could get onto the priesthood of Satanism, <coughs> excuse me, I had to get seven people to sell their souls to the devil. The other thing I had to do, and this might astonish some of you, is I had to become a Catholic priest. I had to go back to my original vocation because you cannot be a satanic priest unless, first of all, you're a Catholic priest. And if that surprises you, I just suggest that you go and you read some of the medieval literature 
You'll see that that is in fact the case. Okay, so fortunately, <coughs> or maybe unfortunately, I had discovered a bishop of the old Catholic Church in the city of Milwaukee who was more than willing to ordain me as a priest in exchange for me making him a witch priest. It was sort of a quid pro quo thing, kind of like what's going on at the White House these days. Except I never got to sleep in a Lincoln bedroom. But anyhow, what happened was, is uh, I got consecrated a Catholic priest, and then later on I got involved with a, the, the patriarch of the Gnostic Catholic Church down in Chicago. And this is my certificate being ordained, uh, pardon me, consecrated as a bishop in the, old, in the Gnostic Catholic Church. And uh, you'll notice a couple of other things that might be important here. One is that you'll notice that this is the ancient and primitive rite of Memphis and Misrium. Now, this is in French, and I apologize for that. Uh, the certificate is in my book, uh, Lucifer Dethroned, if you want to see it and, and try and translate it. Now, the rite of Memphis and Misrium is the rite of masonry that a lot of masons aren't aware even exists. And this rite has 97 degrees. And I was raised to the 90th degree within that. If you'll notice down here, it says I was given the title of Grand Master of the Order of the Temple. That's 90th degree. And at the same time, I was made the Auxiliary Bishop of Milwaukee of the Gnostic Catholic Church. So I was just all set, man. I was loaded for bear. I mean, I had all of these powerful initiations, and I understood all these powerful experiences. And this basically took me over what is called the abyss. Now, that's an occult term, and I don't have time to explain entirely what it means, except once you get over the abyss in occult progress, in ceremonial magic, you transcend good and evil. You become beyond such mundane considerations as good and evil. You're beyond morality and you become essentially a god living on the earth, walking, and, and you basically look at human beings as if they were cattle. And so at this point, I made a choice. I was asked to make a choice because to move through what is called eighth degree within this particular system, I had to choose to either study lycanthropy or else vampirism. Now, lycanthropy is a, a fancy word for werewolves learning how to be a werewolf. Now, I knew a couple of werewolves, and I learned from them, and in fact, it's rather a painful process. And I'm not really into pain, you know, so I decided I'd rather inflict pain than receive it. So <laughs> instead, I went the route of vampirism. So I was, I was taken down and introduced to a, uh, in a church down in Chicago, which was wholly given over to this vampiric cult. And I, I, I was made to drink the blood of what I now believe to be a fallen angel, and, and he, in turn, drank my blood. And by doing that, something happened to my blood, and I was actually physiologically transformed in many subtle ways. My blood type changed. I became impossible for me to eat. I couldn't eat anything. I couldn't drink anything except blood. The only solid food I consumed was the Catholic communion host. And I lived like this for over a year. I couldn't go out in the daylight without getting blisters on my hands. I, I've, I had to get a third shift job working as a, as a, new, excuse me, a newspaper carrier for the Milwaukee Sentinel. Um, I also couldn't get very near garlic. Uh, now, on the other hand, I didn't have the power to turn into a bat or anything like that. I think that's something that maybe Bram Stoker made up. I, I couldn't turn into mist and slide under doors either. Um, so Hollywood kind of embellished some of this. But the point is, I was drinking blood, and I was addicted to blood. Understand this, I, by, by day, so to speak, nowadays, my normal job is I'm a therapist, and I work with addicts 40 hours a week, people that are addicted to drugs, alcohol, and currently gambling. And I, I myself used to be a cocaine addict before Jesus Christ set me free. So understand something. Addiction is powerful, and the essence of addiction is that the more you get of something, the more you want. And, and so I kept needing more and more blood. Now, originally, the way I got around this is um, I, would, I had many witches under me. In fact, by this time, we had more than 175 women that I had personally initiated into witchcraft. That doesn't count the men that my wife had brought into the craft, which were probably just about the equal number. 
And of those women, some of the ones that had reached very high levels in the craft were more than willing to have me bite them in the neck. So I had kind of a harem, if you will, of five or six women that wouldn't mind me tapping their jugular vein every two or three days so I could keep my, my thirst slaked, so to speak. And uh, this went okay for a while, but gradually it wasn't enough. I kept needing more and more and more blood. And it just went on and on. And I, I began to live a life that was like the tortures of the damned. I'd drive through the streets at night in my job and, um, you know, putting newspapers in boxes in the wee hours of the morning. And I'd see the occasional prostitute or whatever, and it would be all that I could do to not leap on that woman and rip her throat out and just drink every drop of blood out of her, out of her body. It was, it was not easy. And the only thing that kept me from doing that was the fact that I really loved my wife, and I knew that if I did something like that, it would shatter our lives if I was caught. It would shatter our marriage, and, and everything would be, would be lost. So at this dark time, I really didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't want to start murdering people, but I knew I was that far away from doing it. Now, at this time in my life, God began to intervene, which was good because I wouldn't know where I would have ended up otherwise. Uh, what happened was is that I, every year I sent a check to the Church of Satan, my tithe to hell, so to speak. And when I got a check back from the bank during this period of my life, some lady at the bank had written on the check, I'll be praying for you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Anyway, what happened was, I just laughed because at this time I was so screwed up, I thought Jesus was a vampire. And I just tossed the check in the file and forgot about it. But you know what happened? Within literally a day or two, my whole life fell apart around me. Within a day or two, I lost all my magical power. I lost all my vampiric power. I lost my job. I got sick as a dog. My wife even got sick. My whole life just it was like I was falling down face into the gutter and I didn't know what was going on I never connected it to because my ego was so great I mean understand something here I was probably one of the most powerful warlocks on the west coast of Lake Michigan and yet one praying Christian lady took me off at the kneecaps that is the power of prayer amen and, and I want to encourage you people, because if you're praying for someone, and I don't think there's too many people around that are as bound up in evil as I was. I mean, they're out there, but there aren't that many of them. And if you're praying for someone, be encouraged, because that is the power of prayer. And especially if you understand how to pray and bind the deceitful spirits that Satan has around that person and to loose the spirits of truth into that person's heart. Um, there's not much hope that, that person isn't going to get right with the Lord sooner or later. It took me about five or six years, but I finally got saved. So anyhow, I was in this dire strait. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I cried out to Lucifer for a sign. And I, I you know, because I, I was supposed to have all this great stuff happening to me, and instead my entire life was a shambles. And I said, what's going on here? I cried out for some kind of sign, and within a couple of days... Mormon missionaries knocked at our door. <laughs> and uh, the funny thing about that, now that might seem, well, that's interesting, but what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? Well, I'll tell you. What happens there is that I had been told many years earlier by this grand druid fellow down in Arkansas that if I ever got in really deep spiritual trouble, what I needed to do was join the Mormon church because the Mormon church had been started by witches, for witches, for the express purpose of... Giving, giving people a place, like, a, play, a place for people like me to hide out and appear to be nice, conservative, white-bred Republican Christians, you know, even though we secretly believed all the same things that witches believed. Now, that might surprise you, but believe it or not, there's plenty of documentary evidence. We go into some of it in our book on the back table called Mormonism's Temple of Doom that, involved, that proves that Joseph Smith was, in fact, a warlock, the founder of the Mormon church, and most of the early church leaders were deeply involved in sorcery. So anyway, we got into the church. We joined it. They, they loved us. We went through the ranks. I became an elders quorum president. We went to the temple. We had been told by this druid that it would be a profoundly occult experience. And guess what? He was right. It was the high point of our occult life. We, we really thought we were on the right track here because we were part of this huge, powerful, wealthy church and yet we were still serving Lucifer. It was like the best of both worlds. 
In fact, we had a meeting about two days after we were sealed with Elder Faust, who at that time was one of the 12 apostles. Uh, I think he was the low man on a totem pole. That's like the ruling hierarchy of the entire Mormon church internationally. We got in there because we knew certain signs and words and tokens. And uh, he told us, after a lengthy interview, he bore us his solemn testimony that Lucifer was, in fact, the god of the Mormon temple. So, you know, we knew we were on the right track. Now, what's interesting about all this is I thought I had it made. But God had other ideas. And even though I was in a church where a lot of false doctrine was taught, you know, I, I say this. I say, if God can use a donkey to preach, he can use the Mormon church to get somebody saved. Amen? Amen. Understand this. The, this was the first time in my life that I had ever tried to be good. <laughs> Think about it. I mean, if you're, if you're a Satanist, you don't worry about being good. In fact, if you go through a day without breaking one of the Ten Commandments, you think you've had a bad day. But now, because I hope you all understand, Mormons are by and large very nice people. They try, try to live the commandments. They try to be good Christians. Of course, I hope you understand, you can't try to be a Christian. Any more than living in a garage makes you a Cadillac, amen? You just have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which Mormons are forbidden to have, that, that, and that's what does it. So I was trying very hard, and I was, I was struggling, and I knew there was something missing. And then the more, you see, again, God can turn things that are even evil into good. They called me to teach a class in the New Testament. And so even though I'd already had a master's degree in theology from the Catholic Church, I never read the New Testament. I never read the Paul, Paul's epistles. And for the first time in my life, I actually sat down and read the King James Bible. That's what the Mormons use. And I found out what was in the book of Romans. I found out what was in the book of Galatians. And I realized that there was no way that Paul could have been a Mormon. Amen? It just didn't work. I realized that I was a sinner and that I needed salvation. And uh, with a lot, it probably took me about six months of really studying and praying and fasting and doing all the things that Mormons are supposed to do when they're faced with a profound spiritual decision. But finally, and believe me, I'm giving you the short version here. Finally, on June 22, 1984, I decided I'd tried everything else. I might as well try this. And I, I took off my magic Mormon underwear because I didn't want any static on the line. Amen. I knelt down at the foot of my bed, and I prayed the sinner's prayer, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So that's, that's the short version. If you want the full-length miniseries version, I'd suggest you check out Lucifer Dethroned out there because it has the whole story. Um, anyway, I wanted to tell you that because I wanted you to see that I know a lot about what I'm about to speak. I am not an outsider. I was involved in this stuff. I was in it for 16 years, not counting the 20 or so years where I was just simply a devout Catholic. And so this is, this is stuff that's right from the horse's mouth or maybe the devil's mouth, as the case might be. Um, and I want to talk now about what's involved in this conspiracy. Um, it may surprise some of you, maybe not, because I know we have a well-informed bunch here tonight, amen. Uh, it may surprise some of you that if you had to put a name to the conspiracy that's come down to us through the ages, that some call the Illuminati, some other people call it other things, but I think if you boil it down to its purest, simplest form, you would identify it essentially as Freemasonry. Now, that might surprise some of you. But understand that masonry has been around a long, long time. It may not have always been called Freemasonry. But masons itself brag about the fact that their first mason was Tubal Cain. Now, Tubal Cain, if you know your Bible, was the seventh man from Adam by way of Cain. And he was the guy that invented metalworking. And he is supposedly the first mason. Now, that's pretty far back to start a conspiracy. Then, of course, you have the flood. After the flood, the Masons say that the first Mason was Nimrod. Now, of course, we all know who Nimrod was. He's the guy that helped build the Tower of Babel. Now, that's pretty good Masonry, amen? And uh, he was the person who basically had the idea for a one-world government. He wanted to start a United Nations. And um, he had all these great ideas, you know, one-world government, all this kind of stuff, new world order. And God had other ideas. And God came down and he cast confusion and, and changed the languages of the people. So they went and scattered abroad on the earth. 
That basically tells us what God thinks about the United Nations. Amen? So anyway, this caused the conspiracy to go underground. And for centuries it existed in various forms. And if, if, you, if you look in the, the books, the literature of Masonry, you will find that Masonry says it is the direct linear descendant from the ancient mystery religions, from the ancient fertility cults. Now what does that mean? That sounds sort of exciting and mysterious and exotic. Well, the ancient fertility cults were cults that revolved around human and animal reproduction. I'm sorry to be blunt, but that's what they mean. It's Baal worship, essentially. If you study the worship of Baal in the Bible, you've got all these false gods like Molech and uh, Baal and Chemosh and some of these others. All of them, their rites involve sexuality. And that's the same thing that masonry is. That's why the god of masonry is the phallus. That's why you have Masonic monuments like the Washington Monument that look like a giant phallic symbol. It's that simple. Um, so this is the conspiracy. And it may have been called many names, like, for example, before the time of Christ, masonry was called the Dionysian Artificers. Uh, later on, it was called the Gnostics, and we'll look at this more in detail in a couple of minutes. But I just want you to realize that even though it was called many things, just like the church, down through the centuries, the church, the true church of Jesus Christ had many different names, but it was the same basic thing. Well, it's the same thing with the devil's church, if you will. Now, people... People get on me about this, you know, and I, I, I get frustrated, I think, because they tell me, well, there's no such thing as a conspiracy. I get this from Christians all the time, and I feel like, you know, knocking on their heads and asking if there's anybody home up there, amen? You know, they say, oh, this is all nonsense. There's no conspiracy. The Bible doesn't say anything about a conspiracy. I mean, excuse me? You know, I mean, for example, just turn to the second psalm. It says in the first verse, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now that's a conspiracy. Not only that, Jesus Christ himself discussed this very same thing. Um, and, and it's important to understand that the key thing of the, of the conspiracy is that it's done in secret. That's the essence of a conspiracy. Jesus Christ says in John 18, I believe it is, in secret have I done nothing. He taught everything openly. Christianity has no secrets. If you want to find out about what's so great about Christianity, we're delighted to tell you. We don't make you go through a bunch of dumb rituals and stand on your head or wear a blindfold or spit nickels while sitting in lotus position or anything like that. I mean, we're just delighted to share what Jesus Christ has done for us. Our lives are an open book. Our Bible is an open book. You know, there's no secrets. But in the Masons and in all these other occult fraternities, it's all secretive. Now, Jesus himself addressed this. And he addressed it using a powerful metaphor which runs like a, like a web of evil through the entire Bible. And if you go to Matthew chapter 16, you'll find that Jesus says something very important. He says, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, he's talking about leaven. What does that mean? Well, happily, we can look at other parts of the same chapter, and Jesus defines it. In the same chapter, in verse 12, it says that he was speaking of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So leaven is bad doctrine, because we know both the Pharisees and the Sadducees were off into doctrinal error. The Sadducees were a lot like today's liberals. They denied the resurrection. They denied the existence of the supernatural realm. They denied uh, the spirit world and so on. And of course, we all know who the Pharisees were. Paul elaborated on this symbolism further. He said in 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now that's, that's the key point of the conspiracy. Because if any of you have made bread, how much leaven, which is just yeast, does it take to make bread? Not very much, just a little bit. I mean, if you put too much in, you're going to have something that looks like the monster that devoured Cleveland sitting there on your countertop. Uh, you just take a little bit, and then you work the dough, and you work the dough, and what happens? The leaven disappears. It just sort of blends into the dough, and you can't even tell where it went but it starts percolating through the entire mass of dough until all of a sudden you've got the whole thing leavened. And that's how this works in the church. 
That's how the conspiracy works in society in general. If you've got one Mason in your congregation, and especially if he's like a deacon or somewhere else in leadership, you're going to end up with um, a kind of one bad apple spoiling the whole barrel routine. That's percolating down, and you're going to have all sorts of issues within your, within your local body. Similarly, if you have a Mason in your family, his spiritual authority is going to percolate down and leaven the lives of, your, of the wife, of the children, of the grandchildren, of the great-grandchildren, down three or four generations, and that's a curse that needs to be broken. Leaven, like yeast, is a living organism which is capable of reproducing itself, and that's what happens. You never just have one of these dudes in a church. They always start recruiting, because Masons are like homosexuals. They can't reproduce themselves naturally. They can only, yeah, amen, they can only recruit. You know, think of that. That's the way with every cult. See, we are born again. Just like a baby is born out of the womb of its mother, we are born again. No other religion, no other cult can do that, most especially the Masons. And so they have to recruit. Just like homosexuals are barren, they cannot reproduce themselves naturally, so they have to recruit. That's why you've got the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses knocking on your door is because they're trying to recruit. They're not trying to do evangelism. They're not trying to win souls because they, if they tried to win a soul, they'd be like a dog that chased a car and caught one. They wouldn't know what to do with it, amen? So this is the problem. They can't reproduce themselves, and so they do it in other ways. Now, the key element here to understand is the fact that Jesus, in another chapter, talks about the conspiracy of leaven in a very, very specific way. Now, I find this very interesting. I, I know what people are going to say when I talk about this. Oh, the chapter and verse numbers in the Bible aren't inspired and blah, 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 blah. But this is interesting. <laughs> if you go to Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. <laughs> now, think about it. Here you've got the 13th chapter of Matthew. And, of course, 13 is the number that's associated with witch covens and with the devil and all this kind of thing. And then you've got the number 33, like the 33rd degree Mason. Interesting coincidence. This chapter is the chapter where Jesus does all of these fantastic parables about the kingdom. And in there he says, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Now, this is kind of a mysterious passage. And I'll tell you, if you talk to three or four different pastors, you're going to get three or four different exegeses of this passage. And I'm going to try and share with you what mine is, and I trust that it's going to be adequate to the purposes. What we've got here is, first of all, we need to identify the woman. It says a woman did this. Now, who is this woman? Well, some people say that this is the church, but I don't think that's correct. Because, first of all, nowhere in the rest of the Bible do you find a woman identified as a church, symbolically. The church is called the bride, the church is called the lamb's wife, but the church is never called just a woman. So that's one reason. There are other ways in which the woman term is used symbolically and prophetically, and that's what we're doing here tonight. We're looking at prophecy. So prophetically speaking, a woman is used in a positive way as a symbol of Israel. For example, you have um, the woman in, uh, let's see, Isaiah 54, 6, Jeremiah 6, 2, or Revelation 12, 1. These are good women. I have likened Israel to a comely and delicate woman. This is Israel in a righteous state. But there's also Israel in a backslidden state. And this is also symbolized by a woman. For example, in Lamentations 1, 17, Ezekiel 16, 30, or Hosea 3, 1, where, for example, we have the prostitute Gomer, as a symbol of backslidden Israel. Then finally, we have the famous woman, probably the most famous wicked woman in the Bible, which is the, the mystery Babylon in Revelation 17, the woman who is riding the beast. So it doesn't seem to me as though there's any prophetic justification for this woman being, in fact, the church. Now, what about the meal? Well, what is meal? Meal is ground up wheat, okay? What is wheat, symbolically? Well, happily, Jesus tells us that in this very chapter. He says, wheat is the children of the kingdom. See verses 25 through 30 and verse 38 of chapter 13. 
So we are the children of the kingdom. But what's this ground up business? Well, think about it. How many of you ever seen actual wheat berries right off the branch, right off the stalk? I mean, they're like kind of like tiny popcorn. You can't eat them. You can put them in a, in a jar of water and soak them and get them to sprout. Or you can grind them up and make flour, but you just can't eat wheat berries. They're utterly useless. And that's how we are. When we get born again, that we're not much used to Jesus. We have to be ground up and broken and made suitable to the master's service. Amen? That is the key here. So we are talking about the children of the kingdom. Now what does it say? It says that this is divided up into three measures of meal and then the leaven is put in each measure. So we got a division. Now if you th look back at the history of Christendom, basically you've got three major divisions of Christianity. You've got the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox Churches, and the Protestant Church. Pretty clear. Now if you think about it, the Roman Catholic Church has a lot of leaven in it, obviously. I mean, they've got idols, they've got doctrinal problems, they've got all sorts of weirdness going on, purgatory, rosaries, things like that. Uh, unfortunately, the Orthodox Church is not much better. They've got a little improvement, but not much. But then we've got the third one, the Protestant. What is the leaven in the Protestant churches? Well, I think we're going to find very readily that the leaven there is Freemasonry in point of fact. Let's look at this. Down through the years, there's been a fundamental symbol that is part of the uh, occult. It's part of Freemasonry. And it's from a, a philosophy called the Kabbalah. Now, what, you may ask, is the Kabbalah? Well, it's an occult system of Jewish mysticism and magic that dates back to just before the time of Christ in the intertestamental period, between the time that Malachi wrote his book and the time that John the Baptist began his ministry. Now, the Kabbalah, we are told, is the philosophical core of Freemasonry. It is the ground philosophy behind Freemasonry. And this is its most central and its most important symbol. You will notice here we've got three pillars. The pillar of severity, the pillar of equilibrium, and the pillar of mercy. Now, the pillar of severity in Hebrew is called the Ima pillar. The pillar of mercy is called the Abba pillar. Now, you all probably know what Abba means in Hebrew. It means father. But Ima means mother. So this is the mother pillar and the father pillar. Now, this symbol is very rich in its, in its many, many layers of meaning. I could spend a whole evening just talking about all the different ways, ways in which it, is, um, which it is interpreted. But for now, we're going to look at it chronologically as a, as a, as a kind of a, a game plan for Satan's work down through the centuries. And we see here, for example, the pillar of mercy, the father pillar. What, what did Jesus call the Judaism of his day. He called it the traditions of the fathers. We today, even Bible scholars, in both Judaism and Christianity, will talk about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a patriarchal tradition. And so what we have here, this is the father or the patriarchal pillar. It represents apostate Judaism because we all understand that when the Jews ultimately turned their back on the message of Christ in Act 7 when they stoned Stephen, what that ended up with is the light spiritually went out of Israel as a nation and Jews had to start getting saved the same way Gentiles did, one at a time. And, and God is not by any means finished with the Jewish people, but they right now they need to get saved just like everybody else does by the blood and the cross of Jesus Christ. They need to receive him as Messiah. Now, on the other hand, here's the mother pillar. What ecclesiastical institution calls itself the mother? Holy Mother of the Church, the Roman Catholic Church. Isn't that right? So we've got here apostate Catholicism on the other side. Now, you've got a, a female and a male, and they come together in the center. The pillar of equilibrium is obviously the balancing factor. And this balancing factor is the fact that these um, two other pillars bring together an androgynous figure, a figure that is both male and female. And what that is, is basically 
witchcraft and or Freemasonry. Because both witchcraft and Freemasonry have a bipolar God. They have a God that is male and female. That's why, for example, the Masons have the square and compass. It represents the God and the goddess, the male and female reproductive plumbing. If you want to see this broken down in a more complex way, <laughs> that's pretty complex. This is just since the 1800s. As you can see, Satan has been a busy little boy in the last few years. And uh, he's gotten a lot of stuff, but you'll notice the main trunk of the tree is still Babylonian witchcraft, which is really the same thing as masonry. And if you don't, I don't have time to document that in great detail, but if you go and look in my book, Masonry Beyond the Light, I go into that in a lot of depth. So this is what has happened down through the years, right up to the present day. And I was involved in about three-fourths of these little arrows that you see, and, and I can tell you quite categorically, it is all part of the same tree. Now, I don't expect to have the time to go into all of this, so I'm going to break this down and make it simpler for you. And we're going to talk about the path of Masonry's royal secret down through the centuries. Now, some of you may recall that, that on that certificate I had from the Scottish Rite, I had this wonderful title, Sublime Prince of the Royal Secret. Now, what does that mean? Well, the funny thing is, if you go up to a Mason and you ask a given Mason who's a 32nd degree Mason, what's the Royal Secret? You know what they're going to say? I don't know. <laughs> I even asked them this. I was myself a 32nd degree Mason, and they knew it. So it wasn't like they were trying to keep something from someone who wasn't worthy of this honor to know this. And I, I said, what's the royal secret? And they'd say, I don't have a clue. I don't know. <laughs> well, tonight, you're going to find out. You're going to learn something that only one in a hundred Masons knows anything about. And it's a horrible secret. It's a disgusting secret. There's nothing royal about it. But it's why it is kept so carefully guarded within the Masonic hierarchy. Let's look at this. We've talked about some of this already, and so I'm just going to kind of skip over it. We got the Babylonian and Egyptian mystery cults. That's where it all began with Nimrod. Then we have the Kabbalistic religions. I talked about that, the Kabbalah. Then we have the Gnostics. The Gnostics are basically people who believe that you are saved by secret knowledge, to put it simply. Gnosticism it comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge like diagnosis or prognosis. And what they believed is that Christianity, as it is constituted in the Bible, is far too simple. It's a, Greek, it's a Greek heresy off of the truth of Christianity. And what it means is, is that you have to go through all sorts of elaborate rituals and details and deal with archons and aeons and logos and all these different things in order to receive salvation. Modern-day Gnostics would be examples, for example, uh, the Mormons, the Masons, a lot of New Agers, all these people believe they're saved by acquiring some sort of arcane, hidden wisdom. Okay, then we've got pre-Islamic sorcery and alchemy. I don't really have time to talk about that, but, but that in turn birthed what is called the assassin cult. Now, some of you may have heard of this. There was a group that came out of Orthodox Islam that was called the Ishmaelians. It was like a splinter group. And these Ishmaelians were a small but powerful heresy. And one of their chief leaders was a sheikh by the name of Hassan e Sabah. And this guy led a group that was called the Hashishim. Excuse me, that's where we get our word assassin, is from the, the Arabic word Hashishim. Now, why were they called Hashishim? Because the word means eaters of hashish. Now, most of you probably have heard of hashish. I hope none of you have tried it, but maybe some of you have. I certainly had my share in my day. Uh, hashish is a powerful form of marijuana, a distillation of its chemically active ingredient, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, which is called THC for short, and it's what gives marijuana its hallucinogenic properties. So if you take hash, or as it's called colloquially, you get quite a buzz off it. And, um, what, how this guy worked. He, was the, he is kind of the father of the modern-day conspiracy. He was the father of modern-day espionage. And he was the first programmer, the first mind control operator. And this is what he did. If someone wanted to join his group, he knew he needed elite warriors, 
because he had all of Islam arrayed against him. And if any of you have studied Islam, you understand that it has a very interesting approach to soul winning. You come up to someone and you say, you're going to become a Muslim? If you say no, I'm going to cut your head off. <laughs> That's how they worked. That is called jihad, holy war. That's why to this very day you will find certain Islamic factions that will think nothing of blowing themselves and dozens of other people up in what they believe is a service of their God, Allah. And so what happens is they believe if they die in jihad, in holy war, they will go straight to Islamic paradise. Now what's Islamic paradise like? Well, in the days of this uh, Hassan, what you had was the belief, first of all, there were no women in heaven. Sorry, no women. Because women didn't even have souls. Um, that's why even to this very day, women are treated very badly in the Islamic faith. Um, beyond that, when you died, you would go to a place called paradise, where you could do all the stuff you weren't allowed to do as a Muslim. You could eat pork, you could drink wine, and there were these beautiful angels called Uris that looked just like Playboy centerfolds, and they would minister to your every whim throughout eternity. And this is the Islamic paradise. Now, what Hassan would do with one of these recruits, because he needed someone who was just a fanatic, and what he would do is he would bring this person in and feed them a sumptuous meal, and the meal would be laced with copious amounts of hashish. In other words, he'd get the guy really stoned. I mean, we're talking seriously stoned here. And then he would take him into a secret garden in the heart of his castle, and there would be beautiful women, all the pork he could eat, all the wine he could drink, and for three or four hours, the guy would just really enjoy himself. And then he would bring him back when he started coming down off the trip. And he would sit him in the chair, and he would say, I have taken you to paradise. I have that power. If you serve me in jihad and die in my service, you will go straight to paradise for all eternity. What do you think the guy said? Where do I sign up? <laughs> you know. And these guys were total fanatics. I mean, they, he was famous for doing things like he'd have 10 of them line up on a wall, he'd snap his fingers, and they'd jump in unison a thousand feet to their deaths, grinning all the way because they were dying in his service and they knew they would go straight to paradise. That's mind control, pure and simple. And it didn't stop there. He also invented the idea of the mole, not the little critters that dig up your lawn, but a, an agent, an espionage agent who was hidden deep within the enemy organization and then when they were needed, they would be called upon to do something. The story is told about a particular person, a caliph. Now, a caliph was like a religious leader in medieval Islam who also was a, was a general. And this caliph came up against and tried to attack Hassan's castle. And Hassan sent him a message. And the message said, if you come any closer to me, you will die. And he laughed. The caliph just laughed. He says, I am surrounded by 150 retainers and bodyguards. Some of them have been with me for 15 or 20 years. Most of them are my own relatives. I am invincible. You can't touch me. The next morning he woke up and there were nine assassin daggers buried around his pillow on his head. Needless to say, he retreated. When uh, Hassan e Sabah died, his last word, he never was caught. He never was captured by the Orthodox Muslims. And he, on his deathbed, his last words were, Nothing is true, everything is permissible. And those have become some of the bywords of the Illuminati that he had such a profound influence on. Okay, moving along, what happened next is the royal secret of masonry passed from the assassins to the Templars. Now, the Knights Templar were warrior knights. They were Catholics that took part in the Crusades that you've probably all heard about. They went over to the Holy Land to try and capture the Holy Land back from the Saracens. Now, the Saracens were a kind of Muslims. During this conflict, which lasted over a century, they began to interface with the um, assassins. 
they began to share each other's secrets. And so when they lost the Crusades, the Templars went back to Europe, immensely wealthy, immensely powerful, and full of occult knowledge. Now you've got to understand something about the Templars. They, they got very wealthy because they basically provided protection for the pilgrims as they journeyed from Europe to visit the sacred places in the Holy Land. And they got very, very wealthy. Plus, there are legends that say that they found Solomon's treasure buried in the ruins of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. And that they were fabulously wealthy. They got so powerful. And interestingly enough, they became the first international banksters. Everybody tries to blame the Jews for that one. But actually, the first international banksters were, in fact, the, the Templars. And um, they got so powerful and so wealthy they threatened the Vatican, which was not a wise thing to do. So the Pope got together with the King of France, and they conspired to bring down the Templars. In 1307, on October 13th, Friday, they sent out warrants and captured every Knight Templar that they could find, including the Grand Master, whose name was Jacques de Molay. Now, Jacques de Molay was a pretty sinister fellow, and some of you may have heard of the Masonic Order, the de Molays. It's named after Jacques de Molay, believe it or not. And this, uh, this fellow was a pedophile. He enjoyed having sex with young boys. He was also an idolater. He worshipped an idol named Baphomet. And he was a practitioner of black magic. And this is the guy that the Masons idolize as a hero for their young boys. What I tell people is the name of a young boy's order after, Adam, uh, after, after Jacques de Molay is like having a Ted Bundy home for battered women. It's sort of a brutal irony, don't you think? So anyway, when de Molay, this wonderful spiritual giant, died, burned at the stake, and I don't advocate that, please. I mean, I think it was a horrible thing that they did to the Templars. He didn't die the death of a martyr. He wasn't like Stephen and said, you know, Lord, please forgive them. He cursed them. He cursed the Pope. And he cursed the king, and he said within a year they would both be dead. And within a year they both were. Now whether that's because he was a powerful sorcerer, or whether it was because there were assassins who did the job for him, we don't know. So, nobody knows what happened to the treasury of the Templars. It vanished. And the best guesses that we have is that it went up to Scotland where it was hidden along with some remnants, because there are vestiges of Templar culture up in the highlands of Scotland that go back to the 1400s. Uh, the next thing is, about 100 years later, along came the Rosicrucians. They had the same secret. Some people say that they were just a, a resurfacing of the Knights Templar under a different name. After that, just 34 years later, we have Ignatius Loyola and the Jesuits. Now, Ignatius Loyola was a Spanish knight. And he got hit in the leg with a cannonball and had to go through a lengthy convalescence. During that time, he had some sort of conversion experience and decided, this sounds familiar, I know, he wanted to start an order of warrior monks, elite warriors that would protect the pope and would serve the Catholic Church unwaveringly. He came up with a name for this order. He called it Los Ilumbrados. Now, if any of you speak Spanish, you know that name means the Illuminated Ones. However, the Pope didn't like that name, and so they changed the name to the Society of Jesus. Um, what's interesting, yeah, it's a little more catchy, don't you think? Anyhow, what's interesting about this is that if you read the exercises which St. Ignatius developed, you will find that they are profoundly occult. You can get them in most bookstores. They're called the Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius Loyola. And they were the beginning of, of what ultimately came to be the Illuminati mind control exercises. The next thing that happened was about 100 years later, operative and speculative masonry began to be born. Now, the Masons have been around for centuries as a stonemason guild, very much like the day we have professional trade unions, like the Carpenters Guild or the Plumbers Union or whatever, where you go through and you become an apprentice and a journeyman and a master carpenter. Well, they had the same thing hundreds of years ago. Except back then, people were illiterate. Except for a handful of people like the clergy and some nobility, very few people could read. And so if I was like, say, a Mason, 
and I came into a new place and I whipped out my local 122 Mason card and handed it to the guy on the job site, he'd, eh, I don't know what this means. Uh, so instead, they developed a system of signs. Like, for example, if I would go like this, they would know I was an entered apprentice Mason. Simple. So it started out innocently enough. But then when the Protestant Reformation came along, all the cathedrals were stopped. The great cathedral building of Europe basically ground to a halt. And that was where the Masons got most of their employment. And so to make up for that fact, the, um, the Masons began to admit non-operative Masons. And these came to be known as speculative Masons. These were people who were just simply interested in learning the occult philosophies of Masonry. They didn't want to become stonemasons, and that, how the, that is how the Masons stayed alive. This finally congealed formerly into what is called the Mother Lodge in England in 1717. In London, at the Apple Tree Tavern, nice spiritual place, the first meeting formally of the Grand Lodge of England took place. And because most all modern masonry comes from that place, this is called the Mother Lodge. The next thing that happened is that the Grand Orient came along about 60 years later. That's the most virulent, anti-Christian form of masonry that exists in the world today. Just a few years after that, on May 1st, which is a high satanic holiday, a gentleman by the name of Adam Wieshaupt started a group called the Illuminati Ordinen, or the Order of the Illuminati. And uh, this is what we're going to try and focus a lot of our time on over the next few minutes, because this is really the modern origin of the conspiracy. This is the guy right here. And as I said, his name is Adam Wieshaupt. He was a professor, Jesuit trained, in canon law at the University of Ingolstadt in Bavaria. And he got the idea that, gee, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to have a society within the society of Freemasonry that would work for the abolition of the monarchy, of the church, and of the family, and bring people back to a wonderful state of pure paganism. So he started putting together a hell broth that mixed four different things together. Islamic mysticism and magic, Jesuit mind control techniques that we've already mentioned, Masonic secrets of immortality, and drug-induced altered states of consciousness. He put these four things together and began to infiltrate the Lodge all over Munich, all over Bavaria, and all over France. And uh, he, he pushed this as a system of replacing the monarchy and the church with a hierarchy of noble philosopher kings, naturally led by him, who would rule the world with benevolent wisdom. Like most fanatics, he had a plan. And as good conspiracies go, it was a good one. He worked his way deeply, especially into the ranks of the French. And if you want to see the fruits of true Illuminism, look at what is known as the French Revolution. The French Revolution exists as kind of an antimatter version, if you will, of the American Revolution. Whereas a lot of the people that were involved in the American Revolution were Christians. In the French Revolution, Illuminism was holding sway. Anti-Christian doctrine, the reign of terror, the guillotine, which ate up thousands and thousands of lives, including the crown heads of, of France. Uh, this was what Illuminism was really all about, unfortunately. And sadly enough, it culminated in an event where they desecrated Notre Dame Cathedral, they enthroned a half-naked prostitute on the high altar and crowned her as the goddess of reason and put a torch in her hand. And believe it or not, this is the origin of the Statue of Liberty. It's not a nice, wonderful thing about freedom. That torch is the light of Lucifer. And that statue was built by a mason was designed by a French Freemason as a gift to American Freemasons. So I'm sorry if I just popped anybody's bubble there, but the Statue of Liberty is not a nice symbol. It's a symbol of the goddess of witchcraft, essentially, holding aloft the light of Lucifer. 
Now, Adam Wieshaupt had a plan. He had a worldview. He thought history moved in a certain cycle. And he believed that if he could catch these cycles, it would basically enable him to rule the world. He saw history as being divided into five stages, and you see them there. This is called the Law of Fives. You have chaos, discord, confusion, bureaucracy, and aftermath. And here's how it worked. In chaos was what Adam Wieshaupt believed was mankind's best and purest state. Excuse me, it was a state of what we would today call paganism, where you're just like the noble savage of Rousseau, hopping through the forest, gathering herbs, hugging trees. I mean, Al Gore would love this. You know, um, basically being a witch and worshiping a mother goddess and everything is happy and joyful and tra-la-la-la-la. Well, needless to say, this couldn't last forever. Into this Edenic state comes the serpent, except in this case, the serpent's name is Jehovah. And Jehovah brings with him the evil cult of monotheism. Now, monotheism is the belief that there's only one true living God. That's what Jews believe, that's what Christians believe, and it's even what Muslims believe. But it's diametrically opposed to paganism. And this is why pagans hate Christians so much, is that we insist that we've got the only right way. If you talk to a witch, they'll say something like, well, that's your truth, and I've got my truth, and all there's everybody's got their own truth, and it's blah, 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 you know, it's sort of like you know they've got cream filling between their ears, amen. Anyway, that's why we call New Agers Twinkies; they got cream filling between their ears. Uh, anyway, what happened is that the the evil monotheist, according to Wieshaupt, this isn't me; this is him talking, so to speak that they oppressed the happy pagans and made them follow rules. They made them stop fornicating in the bushes with everything that moved. They made them stop smoking dope. They made them stop worshiping false gods. They took all their fun away. And this caused a lot of discord and a lot of confusion because the pagans kept wanting to keep doing all of this stuff because it was fun. And so this caused the third stage to come along. And the third stage is confusion. And this happened because, the, you see, the, um, the monotheists had to come up with a reason for why these stupid pagans were still insisting on doing this, and so they invented the idea of the devil. And the devil was making them do it. And so they tried to introduce a devil figure to, uh, to explain the problems they were having, but that didn't work. So the synthesis of stage three failed, and this leads to stage four, which is bureaucracy. I'm sure none of us have any idea of what that is like. And um, what you've got here is this philosophy that emerges where everything must be carefully tracked because the average people, that's you and, you and me folks, are dumb. We're as dumb as a mud fence. We couldn't even find our way out of our pajamas without the government's help. Isn't that right? You know? And, and so they micromanage everything. You know, it's like the nanny state. Take care of this, take care of that, do this, fill out this form. You know, it's like they think we can't even, you know, get dressed and go to work without the government's help anymore. And, and in fact, I, I, I just ran into an interesting example of this kind of mentality. There was a fellow on the news a couple weeks ago who, um, he, he sued Lawn Boy, the lawnmower company, because what he tried to do is take his Lawn Boy lawnmower and trim his hedge with it. And he hurt himself. You know, duh. Anyway, he sued Lawn Boy because he said, you guys should have had a sticker on that lawnmower that said, warning, do not use this to trim hedges or you might lose significant parts of your anatomy. You know? And he won. <laughs> I mean, and, and this is why everything you buy now has 50 stickers on it. It's because the government treats us as if we're all have the mental capacity of the average doorknob. And, and this makes us feel frustrated. It makes us feel alienated. And that's exactly what he wanted. That's exactly what Wieshaupt wants. Because when people get frustrated and they get alienated, what do they do? 
They start smoking dope. They start getting drunk. They start retreating into fantasies, you know, like Star Wars or Star Trek or soap operas or, you know, romance novels or whatever the case might be. And as a result of this, most people end up on the dole or in mental hospitals. This starts eating away at the middle class. And of course, the middle class, <coughs> excuse me, is a source of all capital. And so eventually, the society runs out of money, unless it starts counterfeiting, which of course is what's going on today. Um, and what happens is the whole thing collapses of its own weight, and we end up with aftermath, where the whole thing kind of implodes and falls into ultimate chaos. And then we start over again with the happy pagans, except this time, the happy pagans are ruled over by a benign philosopher king named Adam Wieshaupt. So this was his plan. This is the basic worldview of the Illuminati, and that is reflected in terms of its penetration into masonry. I'm going to show you here a blow-up of my Scottish Rite certificate. And notice what you see up there. Right under the all-seeing eye, it says Ordo Ab Cal. That's Latin. It means order out of chaos. And that's just what I was talking about. This is like the Hegelian dialectic, it's called in philosophy. It's uh, simply put, you, you artificially create a crisis, and then you provide a solution to the crisis, which of course involves more bureaucracy and more government regulations, and all of a sudden, you've had more of your freedom chewed up by some bureaucrat. And this is the idea behind the whole Illuminati game plan. Now, he believed this theory to be true. And he had infiltrated many of the lodges, and, and it was the balloon was almost ready to go up. He was ready to bring down the crown heads of Europe. But God, those are two of my favorite words in the Bible, by the way, but God had other ideas. And believe it or not, an Illuminati courier was galloping through the night, and he was hit by a lightning bolt. I'm not kidding. This is history, folks. And he was blown to bits. He became a Christy critter for day, Satan. And um, this happened in 1785. And when the body was found by authorities, they discovered a saddlebag full of all these secret plans. They broke the code, and they went out and they arrested everybody they could lay their hands on. And the conspiracy was broken. But not before it had so thoroughly enmeshed itself into masonry that there was no way to tell where Illuminism ended and masonry began. It was like sort of a weird spiritual cloning that went on. And this fusion of sorcery with statecraft, which Wieshaupt began, was brought to an even higher level by a gentleman named Albert Pike and Giuseppe Mazzini in the 19th century. And it has tooled Freemasonry into the dangerous machine that it is today as part of the international conspiracy. Okay. Um, what's actually going on here? in terms of becoming an Illuminatus. I mean, people have asked me, well, you were actually in the Illuminati. How do you join? I mean, do you find a little ad in the back of Fate magazine and fill it out and send in $25 and poing, you're an Illuminati? No, it's not quite that easy. Uh, you've got to understand that the Masonic order is like an onion. It stinks. No, more to it than that. An onion has layer after layer after layer after layer. And the outer layers don't know what's going on in the inner layers. This is the way secret societies are designed. This is the way cults are designed. That's why the typical Mason doesn't have a clue about anything that I'm talking about tonight. And if you're a Mason sitting here tonight and you're saying, this guy is full of beans, let me tell you, I know whatever I speak. It's just that you have not been told any of these things because 99 out of 100 Masons are never allowed to know these things. Now, on the other hand, what happens is you get involved in the Masons, and if you know certain things and you know how to say certain keywords and certain signs and certain tokens and certain points of entrance, you are brought into a whole different kind of Masonry that does not involve the normal Masonry that most Masons experience. You begin to learn the secrets of Illuminism. And then they use a cell approach. Now, what do I mean by that? It's just like those of you that may have studied the Communist Party in the 50s and 60s, they had cells. And that meant, I didn't mean they lived in jail cells, it meant that they had a thing where they only, each communist only knew two other communists. 
And that way, if one of them was arrested or something, they couldn't bring down the whole organization. When I was in Milwaukee, I only knew two other people who were in the Illuminati. And then one of them knew somebody higher up that we could communicate with. So this is how it works. There's a sifting process that goes on. The way they go is they bring in the Masons by the dozens. Although actually right now Masons are kind of hurting for members in most parts of the country. Praise the Lord. Amen. But, uh, and I, I would like to think it's because of revival or because of the prayers of the saints, but actually I think it's because people would rather stay home and watch cable TV. But uh, anyway, um, there's three kinds of Masons which seem to be drawn into the deeper aspects of Illuminism. First of all, those with special hereditary bloodlines and preparation. Secondly, those who come to Masonry already prepared with an occult background. Now that was me. I was already a witch high priest when I joined the lodge. And I had all these nice little familiar spirits and ascended masters, actually they were demons, uh, whispering things in my ear. And so when I went through the rituals, I would say certain things that would sort of trip off a lever somewhere, and I would be shunted off the main line of masonry into a little side spur, so to speak, where all of a sudden I would be taught the deeper mysteries and I would be admitted into the deeper things of the lodge. Then the third kind of person that gets into the Illuminati is those who are perceived as being wealthy, powerful, or the right temperament. Some of these people might not even have to become Masons. You know, like for example, Nixon was involved in the Illuminati. And, and many of the other powerful people in our government are Illuminists and some of them may not have even actually been Masons. But they were so powerful that it was seen that they could be a, a, a worthy part of the conspiracy. Now, what happens as a result of all of this is that these people are gradually brought into ever higher and higher levels of seduction. They are prepared emotionally and psychologically to receive the inner teaching. Uh, they are taught forms of meditation and mind control, beginning with the spiritual exercises of the Jesuits. They are taught the tantric principles of yoga. That's the yoga of sexuality, especially the left-handed path. And don't worry if you don't know what that is. I'm going to have to talk about it, unfortunately, in a few minutes. Then they are introduced to hallucinogens and certain secret formulations that are used to open the third eye and bring about what is called enlightenment. Then they are taught the basic principles of occult Freemasonry, which is called archaeometry. And what, might you ask, is archaeometry? Well, in the point of fact... It is something where you learn how to build temples that are suitable habitations for demon spirits. Isn't that a wonderful thing to learn? Anyway, now remember about the law of fives. Well, in, in, in Illuminism, you go through five stages. These are the five steps into the light. The first stage is adoption. This is fellowship with Lucifer. Now, what does that mean? Well you got to realize, Satan is an inveterate copycat. He can't come up with anything creative because he has cut himself off from God, who is the source of all creativity. So all he can do is recycle the same old gobbledygook over and over again. That's, we have a saying, we, you know, you can't teach an old snake new tricks, amen? And so they just, he just keeps trying to do the same thing, and he, he lusts after the kind of stuff that God has. He wants to be worshipped as God. And... And so when he sees Christians being adopted into the family of God, he figures he's going to try and do the same thing with his slaves. And so, and this is, this is something very important that you need to understand. If, if you know someone who's a Mason or if you yourself are a Mason, realize that when you kneel at the altar of Masonry as an entered apprentice and you take that oath, you are adopted into the family of Lucifer at that moment. Now, you don't probably know that. I did, but most people don't even know that. And as a result, if you're a Christian, and mind you, there are pastors that are doing this, there are deacons that are doing this, there are countless Christian lay people that are doing this, and they're ending up with having one knee on the altar of Baal and one knee on the altar of God, and the altars are moving farther and farther apart as we get closer to the end times, amen? And so these people are in a very uncomfortable position. And something has to give. And usually, unfortunately, it's their Christian walk. You cannot serve two masters. And when a person enters the lodge, 
they take an oath that they will obey every summons of the worshipful master of their lodge if within the length of a cable tow. And so they're serving two masters, quite simply. Um, whether they know it or not, they have linked themselves to the devil, and I can prove it to you. In the Masonic ritual, which I had to learn, when you're kneeling at the altar and you've taken this blood-curdling oath, which Christians are forbidden to do, by the way, see Matthew 5, 34 through 37, when you take this oath, then they take the blindfold off, and the worshipful master says, Brother Senior, War Senior Deacon, please remove the cable toe from about our brother's neck because he is now bound by a much stronger tie to our fraternity. So there's a spiritual tie that is created at that moment, a spiritual link. And if you understood the profound relationship between witchcraft and Freemasonry, you would know what that cord, that cable toe meant, because they've got a rope around their neck. And what that means in witchcraft and the occult is that is a symbol of the umbilical cord of the mother goddess, the queen of heaven, linking her to her hidden child. So this guy has just been born again by the queen of hell, the consort of Lucifer. And every entered apprentice mason, in other words, every mason has this happen to them. And they don't understand the dynamics, probably 99 out of 100, but they still go through it. Now what's the next step? Well, it's called illumination. And every mason goes through this too, except it usually doesn't work very well for them. <laughs> what I mean by that is there's a point in the Masonic ritual, just seconds before what I just discussed, where the guy has taken the oath, and then the worshipful master begins reading solemnly out of the Bible, Genesis 1, 1 and 2. And when he says, and God said, let there be light, all the masons in the room clap their hands, and the blindfold off the guy's eyes is removed. And by the light of three burning tapers, he sees on the altar the Holy Bible with the square and compasses laying on it. And this is supposed to give him an altered state of consciousness. Usually all it gives him is a slight headache. Um, then later on, he gets another consciousness-raising experience. And this is third degree. And in third degree, he gets to play the part of the Christ of, a, of, of masonry, which is a guy named Hira Beef, He's blindfolded, dragged around the lodge, accosted it three separate times. The third time, he's knocked on the head by a rubber setting mall, knocked head over heels into a, into a trampoline, trundled about the lodge, buried under a bunch of rubble, and then raised from the dead by the strong grip of the lion's paw, and he learns the secret word of the Master Mason degree. And all of this is supposed to alter his consciousness. However, it doesn't usually do that much unless they've also been doing the Illuminati exercises. And so what is involved there is that gradually you begin to open up your third eye. Now that might be an unfamiliar term to some of you, but the third eye in the occult is called the Ajna Chakra. It's an energy center here, and if it's opened up, supposedly it gives you psychic powers. It gives you the ability to see auras. It gives you the ability to astrally project, to see the future, things like this. Of course, this is all demonic. So what happens is, is gradually, and this happened to me, I went through an experience where I was deluged in the blinding white light of Lucifer. It felt like my brain was being parboiled in pure light. I cried out in agony. It drove me to my knees. It hurt so badly. And, and I received the consciousness of Lucifer. I was illuminated. And this is what it means to become an Illuminatus. It's just a Latin word for illuminated one. And what this means is that gradually something happens to your mind. It's like a satanic virus is introduced into your mind. And just like a computer virus, it begins to overwrite the human software in your brain with evil. With something that's a lack of compassion, a lack of mercy, you begin to look at human beings as if they were cattle or bugs you begin to have just, it, it's hard for me to even talk about because I'm so ashamed of it. This is supposed to bring a quantum leap forward in consciousness and create a higher form of humanity which is called Homo Noeticus, the new man who is as far above human beings as you are above cats and dogs. The next stage is conversation 
What this means is you have communion with the mighty dead. And what that means, essentially, is that you talk with dead people that are supposedly very wise. Like, for example, I, again, as I mentioned, was a trans-channeler. And I would have conversations one weekend with Jesus, the next weekend with Buddha, the next weekend with Zoroaster, the next weekend with Hitler, the next weekend with Aleister Crowley. I was very ecumenical. And um, gradually, this is supposed to increase your level of knowledge, your level of wisdom, your level of occult power. And that was preparing you for the next stage. And this is what is called Congress. And no, that doesn't mean you become a congressman. What this means is you, you have to have sex with a fallen angel. And this is a very appalling and bizarre process. And it really nearly destroys every human being who has to go through it. It nearly killed me. And I was actually, I went through a formal marriage with a fallen angelic being. And of course you understand there's a biblical principle at work here which Satan is using. And that is when you have sex with someone, you become one flesh with that person. And what happens at that point is you become so demon-possessed that it's like burbling up here around your eyeballs. I mean, you know, I had more demons per cubic centimeter than the entire city of Indianapolis, let me tell you. And um, the result of that is that you just become a pretty vile, evil person. And then the following stage, and I just thank God that Jesus got me out of this before I got to stage five, is union. And this is where you become utterly one with Lucifer. You have so many demons inside of you that there ain't nobody home up here but the demons. And there are people like this walking around. I mean, you know, people like Adolf Hitler, people like Charles Manson. And, and I'm not saying that these people couldn't be saved because they probably could, but I know it was very painful for some of the stuff I had to go through to get out of this. And I, I just praise God that he got me out of it before it was too late. Now, I want to explain something about this, because oftentimes when you start talking about the conspiracy, how many of you have heard this? There can't be a conspiracy like this, because people can't keep secrets. The government can't even keep anything secret. Well, frankly, I think the government is keeping a lot more secret than anybody really realizes, amen? But beyond that, there's a reason why this can be kept secret, and I'm going to explain it to you from the inside out. What happens here is you've got a whole nest of demons in your mind. And if you even start thinking about betraying the brotherhood, if you even start thinking about going to the media or going to talk to somebody that could be dangerous, these demons know just where the pain centers are in your brain. And they can instantly inflict upon your brain through just electrical nerve stimulation such agony that it makes the pain a woman goes through when she has a baby seem like a walk in the park without any kind of outside scarring or any kind of bruising or anything. You think you're dying. You wish you would die. And all it takes is a couple of seconds of that and you rethink your plans to betray the brotherhood. Also because of this, and especially at this level, I only slightly experienced it at level four, it's almost like you're part of a giant organism. It's like your brain is just the cell of a larger brain. And, and the whole thing moves in unison. And, it, and it's sublimely malignant how perfectly this thing usually works unless God intervenes. Amen? And what happens is if, if you decide that you're going to go through this and you can fight your way through the pain, these demons will just cause a cerebral hemorrhage in your brain and you'll just drop dead in less than three minutes. Now the only way you can get around this is if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, and that's what happened to me. I mean, Jesus can stop this process, but otherwise it's almost impossible to do this. The other reason, now I talked to you about the stick. Now I'm going to talk to you about the carrot. There's a carrot involved here too, and that is the promise of immortality. You are told that because you've had this sexual marriage with a fallen angel that you are on your path to immortality that you will live forever. And that's pretty neat, if you really believe it. But as you will find out in a couple minutes, the uh, price that you have to pay for this supposed immortality is so profound and so evil 
that very few, few of us would ever want to pay it. It's important to understand that the price involves a kind of spiritual and sexual pyramid scheme of immense power, and I'm going to explain that. Most all of us, well, I think all of us, in fact, have seen this because it's on the back of our dollar bill, amen? This is the back of the Great Seal of the United States, and I doubt if it's news to many of you that this is also a highly constructed occult Masonic symbol. Uh, you've got here Anuit Chaped at Novus Ordo Seclorum. This year begins the New World Order. So when you hear people talking about the New World Order, that's not a new thing. This term has been around for at least a couple, three centuries, if not before that. And then you'll notice here the Roman numerals, 1776. Now everybody thinks, oh, isn't that wonderful? That's when the Declaration of Independence was signed. Yeah, but that wasn't when America was founded. America didn't really officially start as the United States until the Articles of Confederation were signed. And as a result, let's look at something else that began on May 1st, 1776. That's a high satanic holiday called Beltane. And that is the beginning of the Illuminati. That is what was started, a new world order in 1776. Now, notice here there's 13 ranks in this pyramid. And I'm going to talk to you about what that means. Now, I'm going to kind of crack this code. And there's, this is, excuse me, it's important to understand that like any occultic symbol, this has multi-layers of meaning. And what I'm showing you today is not the only way to decode it, but it's the relevant way for our purposes this evening. This is how you break that down. If you'll notice, the lower levels here are the, the well-known U.S. Masonic degrees. They form the foundation of the pyramid. And then beyond that, you have, for example, the order of the trapezoid. That's, that's the beginning order of Satanism. Then you have the ancient and primitive rite of Memphis and Mizraim. That's the 97 degrees. Then you have the Ordo Templi Orientis. That's Crowley's brand of sexual masonry. Then you have the Palladium. The Palladium is where you have to marry a demon or a fallen angel. Then you have the Illuminati. I got one degree into that, and then the Lord pulled me out of it, praise God. Above them are the nine unknown men. These are, are men, sorry, no women, ladies. These are men who are extremely super high-level occult masters who are selected, each one of them, to reign over a continent. And I used to know who the guy was that was over North America, but he's now deceased. And um, these men, in return, report to a group that's called the Seven. And these seven are very, very powerful fallen angels. They're what, is the, what the Bible calls principalities. And they, in turn, report to the great architect of the universe, Lucifer himself. His title in Hebrew is Ayan Sof Or, which translates as the light of limitless nothingness. In other words, Lucifer is a big zero. Um, and this is the hierarchy in basic form. I mean, you could break this down in other ways, but what I want you to understand is it's a giant spiritual, financial, and sexual pyramid scheme. What do I mean by that? Well, all of this stuff costs money. And I think you all understand how a pyramid scheme works. You get a lot of people on the bottom to give a little bit of money, and the people on the top get rich. And then they run off of the money into the Cayman Islands or something. That's why this is illegal. But what happens here is you've got all these people, like, for example, when I went through the Blue Lodge, it cost me about $150 worth of de to get degrees. Now, that was in the 70s. It's probably twice that today. And then I had to pay $150 for the Scottish Rite. I think I had to pay $130 for the York Rite. I had to pay another $150 for the Shrine, plus annual dues for all of these things. Now, in addition, there's dues for all of these things up here. And all this stuff adds up. These people are getting very, very wealthy. And if you don't believe me, look at the, look at the Shrine Temple in your community. That thing is incredibly, incredibly ornate. And all the money that, you know, like they have, do they have a shrine circus here once a year? They talk about their crippled children and all this stuff. I mean, we were driving down the highway coming up here, and we'd pass all these semis 
and they'd have these, these little plaques on the back saying, oh, the Shriners help the crippled children. Yeah, right. The problem is, is that most of that money doesn't go to those crippled children. Only 3 to 4% of that money goes to the hospitals. The other 95% of it goes somewhere else. And that's allowed by the tax laws in this country. So th there's a tremendous amount of money being filtered upward by this. Now, additionally, there's a tremendous amount of energy. Think about this. There's all of these rituals going on all over the world. Like in my personal case, when I was involved in this stuff, I was going to rituals four nights a week. And Satan is up at the top of this pyramid receiving all of this as worship, even though it's boring. I mean, you know, I'll tell you, it is more interesting to watch an ice cube melt than it is to sit through most Masonic meetings. And if any of you are former Masons, you can probably give me a hearty amen to that. I mean, it's just, it's just, forget it. Uh, and, and yet Satan loves this because he's an egomaniac. He wants to be like God. He wants to receive our worship. And that's what he does with all these rituals. But there's also a profoundly sinister aspect of this, which I must get into. And I'm, I apologize in advance because some of this is going to be kind of gross. But we have to talk about the royal secret of masonry and how that fits into this spiritual pyramid scheme. Realize that when you join the Masons, you become yoked to sterling citizens like this. This is a list of all of the prominent occultists of the 20th century, all the witches, all the ceremonial magicians, all the Satanists, all of the theosophists and New Agers that are really movers and shakers of late 19th and early 20th century. Every single one of them was a Mason, a very high-level Mason. Now, what does that tell you? I knew many people, and now some, most of these are now deceased, probably frying in hell. But, but even in my lifetime, when I was a Mason, I knew many, many fellow Masons that were occultists, that were devil worshipers. Now, if you're a Mason and you're a Christian, you're yoked to those people by a spiritual tie that's much stronger than any rope. And what does the Bible tell us in 2 Corinthians 6? It says, Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. What fellowship hath, hath light with darkness? What, fe what concord hath Christ with Belial? It's that simple. You are yoked with a bunch of devil worshipers. And if you are a Mason, you need to repent of that and get out of it because it's like a stinking, dead albatross around your neck. And not only is it dragging your Christian walk down if you really are saved, it's dragging your family down and your children down through generational curses. So this is the danger here. And there's an even more profound danger. I've talked about this guy by name, and I don't think I bothered to formally introduce him. Isn't he a cutie? This is Edward Alexander Crowley, also known as Alistair Crowley. He styled himself the wickedest man in the world. He believed himself to be the great beast, and he changed his name to Alistair Crowley so he could, it would add up in both English, Hebrew, and Greek Kabbalah as 666. In 1904... Crowley had a communication with an extraterrestrial being named Ewas. And this being, through his wife, <clears throat> kind of a channeling type operation, excuse me, brought forth a book that was called the Book of the Law in 1904. And this book declared that the slain and risen God, i.e. Jesus, had stepped off the throne and that a new God, the crowned and conquering child, was taking his place. And as a result of this, Crowley proclaimed the end of Christianity and the start of Crowleyanity. Obviously, the guy had no self-esteem problems. Uh, in fact, he was a brilliant genius. He could play eight chess games blindfolded. He was an accomplished poet, mountaineer, painter, writer. He had so many Masonic degrees that you could fill up five pages of a book with them. This guy was probably the most highly honored Mason in the world. And he was also the most dangerous man of the 20th century. And he began doing rituals to bring forth this crowned and conquering child. And he began to start what he called the cult of the fascinating child. And in doing this, he uncovered, without knowing it, the royal secret of Masonry. 
And what happened was a gentleman came knocking at his door after he published a book. And in this book, he'd, it was a book of poetry, and in the book he had made an allusion to something. And this guy, named, his name was Theodore Royce. He was a German occultist and the head of the OTO, the Ordo Templi Orientis, which stands for the Order of Eastern Templars. There's the Knights Templar again. And this Theodore Royce told Crowley that he had given away the greatest secret in occult history. And Crowley said, what do you mean? I don't even understand it. So the guy promptly initiated him on the spot to the ninth degree of the OTO and then explained the secret to him. And you're about to learn what this secret is. The secret is that as a Mason, you are promised immortality. If you go to a Masonic funeral, you will hear them discuss the immortality issue. You will hear them promise that they will go to the Celestial Lodge above and live there forever. How do they get this immortality? They don't believe in Jesus. The name of Jesus is not allowed to be mentioned in the Blue Lodge of Freemasonry. And, and while there are probably many Masons in this nation that are either nominal or even professing Christians, that doesn't enter into this discussion because it's not mentioned in the funeral. Where do they get their promise of immortality? Simply, the secret that Crowley uncovered, probably through demonic intervention, is the secret that this immortality is conveyed through tantric sex magic. And the kind of sex magic that is, we're talking about here, unfortunately, is a sexual violation of a little child. Crowley taught that the way you could live forever was by vampirizing little children sexually. And he personally bragged of having slaughtered 150 male children in one year. This is why he was called the wickedest man in the world. Uh, and this, I apologize that this is so horrible, but, but Masons are doing this. Not all Masons, please understand me. Probably one in a hundred knows about this. But this is a significant enough problem that I feel compelled to share it with you. In our ministry, with one accord, we have had to pray for literally hundreds of people who are the relatives of Masons either children, grandchildren, nephews, nieces, whatever, and they have been sexually violated by their Masonic relatives, often in Masonic temples. This is why the Masons believe that they will live forever. They think every time they defile a little child, they steal some of that child's youth. And if you notice, children that are sexually abused do age more rapidly because their innocence has been stolen. What happens then is they believe that they are accessing alternate universes, alternate realities where they can become as gods. And I believe that this is why, because this man has been making, it was, was doing these kind of rituals right up until his death in 1947, that we today have an epidemic of child abuse on our hands. Now, the, the final thing I have to share about this, and then we're going to be... Uh, closing for the break is the meaning of this and this is a very mysterious symbol which uh, you know you've heard all sorts of explanations for it but I'm going to give you the the Masonic Illuminati inner meaning of what this means tonight and it's going to probably gross you out and astonish you and I apologize in advance for that but this is what it means Crowley reveals the secret behind the all-seeing eye symbol in one of his books, the Book of Thoth, which is a very advanced manual on tarot card readings. And um, this is the eye of Lucifer. But believe it or not, it corresponds to a human organ that for lack of a more delicate term we'll call the rectum, and which is kind of ironic when you think about it that this represents Lucifer. And what this refers to is that the occult archaeometric doctrine of masonry is that by accessing alternate universes through sodomy, especially of young boys, you can access alternate dimensions of reality through what are called the tunnels of Typhon. Now, you remember I showed you earlier a map of the Tree of Life. Well, everything in magic like everything in the occult, has its yin and yang. It's positive and it's negative. It's good and evil. There's always this dynamism. 
And so therefore, just like there is a tree of life, there is also a tree of evil. This is called the klephot in Hebrew, which translated means harlots. And you'll notice here that all of the names are all evil. And these Typhonian tunnels are the paths between these ten evil worlds. Now, if you want a little bit more on this than I have time to get into right now, you can read the book Lucifer Dethroned because it does go into it. But here is what is ultimately involved. They, there is a belief that through this sexual perversion, they can access these tunnels into alternate universes, alternate realities. And the goal of this kind of magic is to find your own universe and become the god over that universe. This buys into the, to the modern day physics theory that there's many, many dimensions of reality. I, maybe you've read about that. Alternate universes, it shows up in science fiction a lot. And, and then once you're the god of this universe, you can start sucking the energy out of it. And you can use that energy through this child to live forever and ever and ever. And there are men, I, I, I have met several that claim to be hundreds of years old. Now, of course, are they lying their lips off? I frankly think they are. This is a deception. Satan is deceiving these people to draw them into all kinds of profound evil. But the, the important point is not, does this really work? The important point is, do these people believe it? And sadly, they do. And this broad genre of magic is called, and here's a nice big word for you, transuguthian magic. And all that means is it's, it's magic that goes into trans-Plutonian space, space beyond the planet Pluto, which they believe is beyond the pale of the sun and therefore beyond the pale of the Judeo-Christian God. They believe there are gods out beyond Pluto that are far more powerful and far more dangerous and far more deadly than either God or the devil. And that's what these beings, these men, are trying to access. Now, please understand me. I can't say this strongly enough. Only probably one or two out of a hundred Masons is doing this. But that's more than we need. Amen? I mean, we're getting, this is such a problem that we are actually, I now know of five national support groups that are helping people that are survivors of Masonic ritual abuse. This is that serious a problem. And let me tell you something else. The other 95, 96, 97 Masons have an even bigger problem because the spiritual headship over their organization trickles back down to this monster. And because of that, even if they're good men, even if they don't know about this, you know what happens? They begin to struggle even if they're Christians, with profound temptations to move in this area of pedophilia and homosexuality. And this is dangerous stuff. I mean, this is spreading throughout the world like a plague. We have organizations like NAMBLA, the National Association of Man-Boy Love, which their slogan is sex before eight or it's too late. And they're trying to lower the age of consent to eight years old. And all of this can be laid at the door of this occult monstrosity. Now, here, here's the issue. Just like, you know, we have a saying in the state where I come from. You lie down with dogs, you get up with fleas, amen? If you're a Mason and you're in an organization with this kind of spiritual headship, this is all around you and you don't even know it. It's like a fish swimming in polluted water that's full of spiritual sewage. And you can't help but take this into yourself. And even if you're a Christian, this is going to have an impact on you. Even if you are, I mean, even in my case, and I wasn't a Christian at this time by any extent of the imagination, but it's important to understand that in all of this, that I myself, as a normal, red-blooded, heterosexual, was finding myself continually drawn into sexual thoughts and sexual fantasies about little boys. I thank God I never acted on any of that. But it was being forced on me because I was under the umbrella of the Masonic leadership. And it, it, it is really a very tragic thing, but it is, it is very real, this kind of headship. 
So the, the bottom line here is that you cannot be a part of this and be a follower of Jesus Christ. I heard another brother say it this way. You cannot at the same time be, in, be an intelligent Mason and an intelligent Christian. It's that simple. Now, people ask me, what's the big deal about all of this? And I, I'm going to end this with something a little bit more uplifting, because I know that probably just demade, dismayed the living daylights out of everybody. Um, this is a very important symbol in Masonry and in, this, and in Satanism. It's called a trapezoid. Doesn't it bother you a little? Doesn't it look unfinished somehow? That's the idea. In architecture, this is called a frustrum because it frustrates people. And this is believed by Masons who understand this stuff to be the ideal shape for manifesting demons. That's why Masonic altars are all built in a trapezoidal shape. That's why haunted houses often have roofs that are called mansard roofs. It seems to attract more demon spirits. Now here's the deal. You put this on top of this, and you've got the thing that's back on the dollar bill. But notice something. Let's go back to the original symbol. Why is this incomplete? What does that mean? Nothing in this thing is there by accident. Nothing in this symbol is there by accident. This is incomplete because the capstone is missing. What did Jesus Christ say in Matthew 21? He says, did you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected the same has become the head of the corner? Now I ask you, what, is the head, what stone can be a headstone and a cornerstone at the same time? The top of a pyramid. And Jesus Christ is the capstone of this pyramid because it is an expression ultimately of the Trinity. That's why this is in the way. Satan thinks by putting his little idol here, he can keep Jesus Christ from descending to the earth and assuming his rightful place as the top of the pyramid. And there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of interesting stuff here. In the next couple of verses, he says, in verse 44 of Matthew 21, he says, whosoever shall fall upon this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to a powder. Now, what does that mean? Well, think about it. If you have a stone that's shaped like a pyramid, if you fall on it, you're going to break like that. If it falls on you, it's going to crush you to a powder. And I submit to you that what that is is a, an image, a biblical typology of the first and second coming. Because the first time Jesus came that we might fall on him and be saved and be broken like we talked about earlier. The second time he's coming, if you aren't a member of his body, bam, you're going to be ground into the dust. No more Mr. Nice Guy, in other words. And that's what this symbol is, and that's why Satan is so desperate to keep this as his symbol, is because he does not want this pyramid completed. But we know that no matter what Satan does, it is going to be completed, because nothing can stay the hand of God. And that second advent, I believe, is very, very, very close. And on that note, I'm going to uh, bring it to a close for this portion. Thank you very much. Please keep your seat. Let me have some volume here.